Hello, welcome back everyone um, to the final session of the final day of the workshop. So well done for making it this far on a Friday afternoon. Um, just a reminder that this is being recorded and uh, if you have questions throughout the session, then you can either write them in the chat or wait till the end of the talk and raise your hand and unmute yourself. Um, the next talk we have is an invited talk um, from Theodora uh, Karalidi who is going to be talking about modeling the spectra of brown dwarfs and planets. Um, so Fyodora, uh, when you're ready, you can go ahead and show your screen and make sure it works. Okay. That looks great. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, in this last session, we are going to be taking you to the dark realm of brown dwarfs. Exoplanets are cool, but I think brown dwarfs are cooler. Sorry about that. And uh, we are going to be um, I'm going to be showing you a bit of an overview about uh, how we're modeling the spectra of brown dwarfs, and in particular, how the very good quality of data we have been getting from space and ground-based telescope in the last decade have really driven most of the updates we are doing uh, to our RD codes. And I think it's a great outlook for what uh, you can expect for exoplanets in the coming James Webb and ELTs era. But just so that we get everybody on the same basis, I thought of uh, recapping what brown dwarfs are first. And I know a lot of you think of them as failed stars, uh, but I hope by the end of this session, you are more convinced that they are actually rogue planets. Uh, they may be forming in a different way, but they have atmospheres that are more planetary-like than stars. And for masses, we are looking in the mass regime of 13 to 8 Jupiter masses. And as far as effective temperatures and gravities are concerned, we are really covering the whole range of properties we meet in exoplanets and planets in our solar system. And you can see, for example, here, uh, sorry, my laptop is behaving a bit weird, so I cannot see my mouse anymore. But you can see that uh, with the L dwarfs, for example, we are covering the hottest uh, part of exoplanets, some of uh, the ultra hot Jupiters around 2000 Kelvin, going all the way down to about 1400 Kelvin. Then we have the LT transition, which is a really narrow band, uh, about 200 Kelvin all in all in the evolution of brown dwarfs, where things change very rapidly in these atmospheres. And then we're going to the T and Y dwarfs, where uh, temperatures can become so cold, uh, like some of the coldest planets in our solar system, uh, that as you will see, we even have ice water clouds in these atmospheres. Now, from 2000 Kelvin down to 300 Kelvin, you can imagine we cross a lot of condensation curves. So a wealth of clouds has been expected in these uh, atmospheres with the hottest of them, the L dwarfs, having clouds like what you guys are used to for the hot Jupiters, like liquid iron clouds and uh, perovskite and corundum clouds. Uh, but we can go all the way again to ice water clouds for the white dwarfs. And uh, because we have such wealthy cloud system, we are also looking at uh, spectra that are very similar to the spectra of famous exoplanets. And you can see, for example, in the CMD here that uh, we have the brown dwarfs in the background covering the orange, bluish regions you see on the graph and overplotted, you have the colors of a number of the known image exoplanets and you see they really nicely overlap with uh, the colors of brown dwarfs. And also at the bottom left corner of the image here, you can see we have a spectrum from gravity of one of the HR 8799 exoplanets. And you can see it has a really nice match with the spectrum of Lumen 16A, which is a brown dwarf in the LT transition. Now, uh, one thing you might think is, why do we care for the atmospheres of these objects? Uh, we are talking about objects that are about one Jupiter radius. They have a mass of 13 to 80 Jupiter masses. So the atmosphere is but a teeny tiny part, both in length, like in size, and in mass. So why do we care? 
So you care for this for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, as you will also see in the next talk, uh, by constraining the atmospheric properties, uh, we can constrain the formation of these objects. Are they more brown dwarf-like or more image exoplanet, planetary mass companions? Uh, but also, atmospheres on their own right, they're very intriguing bodies where we have a great interplay of energy escaping to space with opacities, with uh, clouds. Uh, so understanding these atmospheres is really important. And I think Kali in her talk later on will also expand on this. And also atmospheres are crucial for the evolution of these bodies with time. And that is because they are the ones that actually control how energy will escape to space. So they're the ones that control how the bodies will cool over time. And in order to constrain the atmospheric properties of a brown dwarf, like with exoplanets, we need good radiative transfer codes and good retrieval algorithms. Uh, but both of these are just as good as our data are. And in the last decade, decade and a half, because of uh, Hubble, Spitzer, and some really good ground-based telescopes, we have really seen our models changing with time, as I will show you in the next couple of slides, because of really good data. So for all of you that have been following all this week of the workshop, uh, I'm pretty sure by now you know how radiative transfer goes. Uh, this uh, work, the same thing is for brown doors. We need a temperature pressure profile, uh, composition we're putting uh, in our atmosphere. We can choose if we want to have clouds or not. Then uh, we use this as input in a radiative transfer code, uh, like Picasso, and then we produce our amazing spectra, like you see here, the Sonora Bobcat spectra uh, published this summer by Marlin collaborators. And then we start fitting them to our data, and we would expect that everything works fine, uh, but uh, in some cases it does, and in some other cases it doesn't do that well. Uh, we very often with brown doors uh, started seeing that our models are not really matching our observations. And the question of course rose, why? What were we missing in the first place? And uh, some examples of these mismatch you can see here uh, where the left plot shows uh, spectra with the black lines of six brown dwarfs, all of them, uh, most of them in the LD transition except the last one. And on the right side is another brown dwarf in the LD transition. And the uh, red lines in both cases are theoretical models. And you see that we do fit pretty well the water band in most cases, but everywhere else we have a problem. Our models just don't work to fit the data. And why does this happen? Uh, in order to understand, I will take you one step back and explain a bit the observations we have been doing for these objects. And in particular, uh, with Spitzer and Hubble, uh, for the last 15 years, we have been getting really amazing observations of brown dwarfs. And with time-resolved observations, we have opened a new window in these atmospheres. And what we're doing with time-resolved observations is we're observing an atmosphere as it rotates around its axis during a single or more than one days of this target. So as you will see in this video, uh, which I hope works because my mouse doesn't want to collaborate. Uh, one second. Okay, so as you will see in this video, both the spectra change with time and the disk integrated light in the J band changes. And this is because something changes in the brown dwarf as we observed it in the course of one rotation. And it's not only this target that we have seen varying, but actually a number of brown dwarfs out there, so variability, uh, being more um, LD transition targets like Lumen 16AB you see here, uh, or even white dwarfs, where if you remember, uh, we expect ice water clouds in these atmospheres. And not only do they show variability, but if we keep on observing over multiple rotations, you see that the light curve changes shape with time, which means that there's something changing rotation after rotation in these atmospheres. And um, 
all brown dwarf atmospheres are practically variable. Uh, it's not only the LT transition uh, brown dwarfs I showed you uh, in the previous slide and some white dwarfs here, uh, but it's more a matter of uh, viewing geometry, if we will see them varying or not, as was shown by uh, Joanna Voss and collaborators back in 2017. And uh, by that, we mean that uh, if you imagine observing Jupiter and you would see it Equator on and you have the great red spot, it would pass in and out of you. So you would see variability, right? But imagine now Jupiter and you see it pole on, you would see no variability from the great red spot. Uh, so all brown dwarfs should be varying. It's just a matter of how we view them, whether we see that variability or not. And it's not only brown dwarfs that show variability. Uh, we now know that also planetary mass companions and image exoplanets should show comparable variability. We have a number of targets for which we have detected variability and some targets for which we have hints of variability. And hopefully with the James Webb uh, telescope, uh, soon we will have uh, more robust detections. Now, what this variability means, uh, Ian Crossfield using VLT observations in 2014 published the first map where he was using observations of Lumen 16b in the course of one rotation. And they showed that uh, we are talking about very complex atmospheres with dark patches and bright patches coming in and out of you. So clouds in these atmospheres rotating in and out of you actually leave their mark on your observations and you see their spectra and light curves changing. Um, and with Spitzer, we have been able to observe uh, that if you keep on observing for more than one rotation, you will actually see a very often very rapid changes. Uh, in this plot here, we have observed uh, Spitzer for four, with Spitzer for four consecutive rotations. And you see that we have a very rapid change in the light curve. And this cannot be explained with just a patchy cloud model like the Crossfield et al model here, but we actually need banded structures in the atmosphere. Uh, think of Jupiter or Neptune. So we need the similar banded structures in an atmosphere to be able to reproduce these light curves. Now, this has been uh, something we were partially expecting from general circulation models, uh, but uh, they were undecisive because we did not have good enough data until that point. And some models were suggesting that we have most vortices in these atmospheres. Other models could produce banded structures, uh, but with such observations from Hubble and Spitzer, for the first time, we were able to place constraints on GCMs and actually uh, with the introduction of proper clouds, Dan and Soman uh, were able to reproduce variability comparable to what we have been observing with Spitzer. Now in retrospect, uh, and part of the reason why I think brown dwarfs are really planets rather than field stars, uh, we should have known all along uh, because we should have taken a look back at our own solar system. And uh, the problem is we often turn to our solar system, but we don't think of it in terms of a brown dwarf uh, because we are thinking, for example, of a planet like Jupiter in the visible, where probably the picture you have is a great red spot and you expect that that would actually be uh, the one that defines your light curves. Uh, however, if you look at Jupiter in the infrared, like you see here, like J and collaborators showed in 2019, you will see that the light curves you're getting uh, look a lot like the light curves we have from brown dwarfs, uh, but also their shape is defined by the banded structure in Jupiter. So we should have known that looking in the infrared, uh, we were seeing more banded structures and belts. Now, um, after this mini intermezzo, um, I think you can understand partially why our spectra have not been matching with our observations. Because when we get an observation of a brown dwarf, we get a snapshot of the whole visible disk. 
But when uh, we have a disk that looks more like this thing here, we have a lot of components, a lot of temperatures, we're observing a lot of different cloud structures. While when we're comparing with a theoretical model, initially, what we have been doing is just getting one model with one effective temperature, one gravity, and try to match this whole complex image of a brown dwarf with that one model, which doesn't work. And realizing this, we have started using blends of models in order to feed our data. And in some cases, we are doing a much better job. However, there are other cases where we realize that we are still missing things uh, from our recipes. Uh, for example, uh, you can see in all of these models, there are regions where our observations and our models really don't match each other. And you can see something similar here, uh, where the best fit equilibrium chemistry model with the light green uh, color doesn't fit the data at all. And the reason why this happens is because not all atmospheres of brown dwarfs, as we realized eventually because of our data, are in equilibrium chemistry. And in order to model this equilibrium chemistry, um, the first and easier way we have been doing it is by using so-called post-process spectra. In which case, what we're doing is we're getting an equilibrium temperature pressure profile, like what you see here, and a composition uh, of the atmosphere. And in this case, I just saw you an example from methane. And then based on the atmospheric properties, we decide where the atmosphere should be quenching methane. We freeze the abundances, change the profiles of uh, the abundances in our atmosphere, and we produce our spectra. And you can see, uh, for example, in this paper from Gebal and collaborators in 2009, that we do a really good job. Uh, the ammonia feature here has been the basic source of problems for Gliese 570D because the atmosphere is depleted in ammonia. And uh, we were not able to fit it with any equilibrium models, but with a post-process spectrum, we can actually do it. However, the fact that the post-process spectrum does fit these observations doesn't mean that we have accurately characterized this atmosphere. And that's something you need to always keep in mind. And the reason why is because uh, if you have worked with any radiative transfer code, you know that there is always an interplay of the temperature pressure profile of the atmosphere, so the energy the atmosphere has with opacities, with changes in the temperature pressure profile, being able to change the opacities in the atmosphere, uh, what molecules you can have in a given layer, uh, which then changing will change the temperature pressure profile and so on. So the best way to actually model this is make an iterative process in your radiative transfer code that keeps both in balance. And Philips and collaborators did it in 2020 already, publishing the Atmo 2020 uh, grid of models. And you can see, for example, uh, how the disequilibrium chemistry brings a really different CO signal here. And we uh, have also done it uh, now with the Sonora models. Uh, soon, uh, you will be able to access the Sonora Toya models uh, from uh, Zenodo. Uh, we have used an iterative scheme in order to model clear atmospheres uh, with disequilibrium chemistry. And you see, for example, how some species like CO can really clear, leave a clear uh, signature in our spectra. And when we try to fit observations like Gliese 75D, uh, you can see that while the equilibrium model with the red line here over predicts how much ammonia we should have in the atmosphere, uh, our models now do a much better job. And we have even started comparing our new generation of models en masse with observations. Um, Philips and Tal 2020 have already done it, showing uh, with black lines here, you have uh, all the observations of brown dwarfs. And the um, uh, lines you see here are equilibrium models and disequilibrium chemistry models. And we see that we start doing a better job in fitting the colors of the atmospheres by including disequilibrium chemistry. And the same thing we have noticed as well with our models. 
Uh, here we have used observations of T-doors from Kirkpatrick et al. 2019. And while the equilibrium models were not able to fit the colors of T-doors uh, with this equilibrium turned on in our atmospheres, I uh, can see we do a much better job now. Uh, of course, there's a whole region here where you see that our models are still lacking something, uh, but we know that at these temperatures down here, clouds should have kicked in the atmosphere and the models we have produced so far are clear. So we know that the next step is to uh, introduce clouds and disequilibrium chemistry combined. And speaking of clouds, um, you have probably heard already from Natasha, Ryan, and a lot of other people uh, here that they are crucial for all atmospheres and also a pain to model very often. Also for brown dwarfs, uh, often they are the cause of mismatch in our spectra. And there has been a lot of work done recently to start upgrading uh, clouds from the traditional recipes we use like the Ackerman and Marley, uh, clouds uh, in order to uh, now include, for example, variable sedimentation efficiencies or uh, use uh, combinations of me, uh, different uh, cl me clouds with different optical properties like Luna and Morley recently published in order to mimic amorphous crystal clouds. And we see that these start fitting our spectra better. Now we have a really good uh, spectra and we have good models to fit them and we think what we see is clouds uh, but that may not be the only thing that happens in brown dwarfs and in particular Tremblay and collaborators have published a series of papers uh, where they suggest that we may not need clouds at all in most of the LT transition brown dwarfs uh, but what we are dealing with is uh, changes in chemistry in the atmosphere because of changes in the temperature pressure profiles leading to vigorous convection. And they have shown that we can actually reproduce the variability we observe in the LD transition with just chemistry changes. Uh, what they do note in their 2020 paper is that unfortunately in our traditional observations in flux, these mechanisms are actually degenerate and there is no way we can tell them apart. We cannot know if it's clouds or chemistry changes. Uh, however, uh, with polarimetry, we will be able to separate the two and um, polarimetry is for brown dwarfs already accessible from the ground. Uh, we can not only detect planets, we can also actually characterize them. And uh, the good thing of polarimetry is that it's sensitive to the atmospheric properties um, and also the location of features on a map that we're using. Uh, so we can not only, for example, uh, break degeneracies in maps we have been having with flux only observations, um, but we can also figure out if our atmosphere actually has clouds or it has chemical changes that cause the LT transition. And there's already a number of codes out there that are uh, able to map, to create the polarimetric uh, spectrum of a brown dwarf or an AMATS exoplanet. And we have used a number of them in order, for example, to map the atmosphere of Lumen 16A, like what you see here. Uh, but uh, we are also learning now with the data improving that we need to uh, improve our models as well. And uh, one note of caution, for example, came recently from a paper submitted by Mukherjee and collaborators uh, this summer, where they actually show that the traditional approach we have been having of our running a radiative transfer code, producing our polarized spectra, and then blending them in maps like the ones you see up here in order to produce the disk integrated spectrum of a brown dwarf needs to be done with caution. And the reason why is that traditionally when, for example, we create a banded structure, we assume it's a pretty much a solid feature 
where you have some variability of the temperature across uh, different longitudes, uh, but that's it. Well, in reality, general circulation models suggest that banded structures will have a lot of vortices in them, and these will affect the uh, polarization emitted by these structures uh, to the point that in some cases we can have a difference of up to a factor of two in the degree of polarization we detect um, or model, depending if we are dealing with a solid band or a more realistic GCM uh, produced band. So in the next uh, model efforts, we should really take into account general circulation models in order to inform our polarized uh, radiative uh, retrieval algorithms. So for Brandorf, we're also using high resolution spectra. And um, unlike what you have been seeing for exoplanets, uh, we uh, have really nice star detections from the objects themselves. And we don't need to use them in order to detect, for example, potassium in the atmosphere. We know it's there. Uh, what we are using high resolution observations for is to start creating 3D maps of brown dwarf atmospheres. And uh, just uh, about a month ago, there were two papers uh, accepted and submitted with one day difference to the archive. And you can see their uh, basic observations here. Uh, so Heinze and collaborators and Manhavakas and uh, collaborators observed two different brown doors. And uh, they both uh, reported that they see a difference in the variability amplitude they get in the alkali lines in comparison with what we get in the continuum around the alkali lines. And uh, that you can also see here in these plots where you see we have a higher amplitude variability for potassium than we have for the continuum around it. And what does this mean? If you get a contribution function, uh, like the one you see here, you will notice that different wavelengths probe different pressures in the atmosphere. And that's something you have probably seen before. Uh, for brown dwarfs, we generally probe much deeper pressures than what you would have for, say, transiting exoplanet. But for <clears throat> excuse me, but for the potassium lines, uh, you can see uh, we are probing much higher up in the atmosphere than the continuum does. So uh, by detecting differences in the variability we get in the potassium or at sodium or different alkali lines eventually in comparison to what we get in the continuum, uh, we are seeing that there's a different cloud structure that affects the higher up in the atmosphere layers you see here than the deeper atmospheric layers that you see here. So we are slowly building um, 3D images of these atmospheres. Uh, here you see just a cartoon depiction of uh, the 3D structure of the atmosphere, but we can keep on building observations of high resolution over more one rotation or more of these atmospheres and create really well-constrained 3D maps, especially using ground-based uh, telescopes and James Webb in the future. And you might wonder why had we never noticed this with uh, Hubble before? And the reason is because Hubble is a great telescope, but it has really low resolution. So what was happening is that we were actually blending the variability in more layers because of the lower resolution we're getting and thus the variability in the alkali lines was really similar to the variability in the continuum. And um, as my last slide, um, I wanted to finish with saying that um, we are really, really looking forward to the era of James Webb, VLTs and ELTs. We're collaborating together, giving us more and better data. And one thing we have learned so far from Brown Dwarfs in the last decade, decade and a half, is that we should expect to be surprised by those data. And it's never the data's fault. It's always our models that have things that we missed, things that we considered not to initially be important, but they turned out to be more important uh, in actual uh, brown dwarfs. And I think the same thing will be true for exoplanets. Uh, so I think that we are gonna be working on updating our decodes uh, based on input from data for many years to come. 
and that was it. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful overview. And someone who also works on Brown Dwarfs, I completely agree that they are very interesting and very cool. Um, we may have time for one question. If anyone has any, you can either write it directly in the chat or raise your hand and unmute yourself. I may just quickly ask you uh, which telescope or instrument are you most excited about for the future in terms of uh, the revolution of Brown Dwarf uh, spectra? Oh, that's a hard one. I <laughs> initially like James Webb and Neary Sauce, but lately I've been working with ground-based telescopes and I start liking them more and more. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very, that's a very diplomatic answer. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, I don't see anyone with raised hands in the chat. So I will just say, yeah, if anyone wants to continue the discussion or has any questions and you can put it in the Friday Slack channel. Um, in that case, so we will move on to the next speaker so we don't overrun on time. Thank you again, uh, Theodora, that was a great talk. Uh, so the next speaker we have up is uh, Paulina Palmer Bifani who is going to be talking about atmospheres of massive planets and brown dwarfs as a clue to distinguish between formation mechanisms. So whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and share your screen. Okay, sorry for that. My computer just kind of did strange stuff. That's okay. Uh, I will share now. Uh, I don't see your screen. Are you one, sure? One second. Okay, so here we are. Can you see it now? Yep. Do you want to put it in presenter mode? Just make sure it works. Yeah, of course. Okay, okay. that looks great. So you can go ahead. Hi. Uh, so I am Paulina. Thank you for having me here. It's really a pleasure to be part of this uh, sessions. And I'm going to talk to you about my master project which is called Atmospheres as a clue to distinguish between formation mechanisms. And here you can see the name of my advisors and other members of our research group. So here is the outline of the presentation and let's go. So how do we distinguish a massive planet from a brown dwarf? So this is like really a smooth uh, go from the last presentation to this one. And the idea is that uh, from brown, brown dwarfs to giant planets, we have a continuous transition, but we are looking uh, each time at like more molecular features if we go down in temperature. But this is not straightforward because then we have hot Jupiters, which behave extremely different. And all these features then uh, can tell us about the properties of the objects. But so, as, as we were just uh, looking at, between uh, brown dwarfs and giant planet, there is not such a big difference. So brown dwarfs actually behave pretty much as, as giant planets. So the idea is uh, to think how can we actually differentiate these two type of objects or, or how can we say that they are similar? So a possible way of doing this is by uh, looking uh, from the atmospheric features, uh, a signature that relates to the formation process. And this can be done by, by their composition. And for example, uh, by studying the C2 ratio or the metallicity of the objects, we can actually try to make this connection. And this is the idea of the project. Okay, but just to make a small overview, what is the C2 ratio for stars in general? So we are talking about C2 ratios to connect the, uh, this value to the host, uh, to the formation mechanisms, but with what are we comparing this value? So, for instance, uh, Brewer and Fisher show this really nice plot 
where we are seeing at an histogram of the CQ regions for stars in general, and we're looking at the value for the sun. So this, uh, for stars, the CQ rich actually uh, has this distribution. And uh, what we can see from here is that uh, a parameter that is really important is the time of formation of the system. Because since uh, younger systems are more in haste in metallicity, this actually here we're looking at the time of the universe and how the CQ ratio actually changed for older stars and new stars. So for a young system, we're expecting a higher CTO ratio as for example, for the sun. Okay, but this is for stars. So how now how can we uh, interpret the CTO ratio for brown dwarfs or on, on exoplanets? So let's just briefly think about their formation processes. Uh, brown dwarfs could be formed through gravitubulin fragmentation, which is a mechanism in molecular clouds where through turbulence, you can end up forming low mass objects. And then we can think that exoplanets actually are uh, formed through core or parallel accretion in protoplanetary disks. But these are not the two only mechanisms because we then have gravitational instabilities, which is a mechanism that on massive disks, you can end up forming uh, planetary mass companions or even higher mass companions as brown dwarf. So, it's not really straightforward to make a difference between brown dwarf and exoplanets by just looking at their formation mechanism because they could be formed through the same type of, of process. And this is actually uh, mixed then with migration processes as we were uh, seeing during this weeks. And migration processes will change everything. So actually interpreting a value for the CTO ratio is very difficult because if the planet migrated by planet planet scattering event, then we will have a CQ ratio that does not behave uh, as we expect for that current location. Okay, so what will we expect for the CQ ratio if we have a massive planet formed in a protoplanetary disk? So since the star is heating up the disk, what we will see is that we will have this snowline <coughs> where a different element <coughs> will uh, change from its solid phase to its gaseous phase. So here, if we form a giant planet inside the, for, in, for example, the water ice land, then all the carbon and oxygen available in the system will be on, on the gas. And this will make that the atmosphere of the planet, since we're looking at the gas, will have a CTU ratio that is similar to the hosta or the properties of the molecular cloud. But if the planet then is formed uh, behind the water island, then a lot of oxygen will be on the solids and the planet will accrete its gaseous envelope from the gas, which will have an enhanced CTO ratio comparable to the hosta. And this then can be extrapolated to the other snow lines, but just up until the CO snow land, because then we'll have all the carbon and oxygen actually on the solids and we cannot say much about the value for the gas. So this is the main idea. But this is, of course, it's more complicated because the location of the lines depends on the hostar and on the evolution of the hostar. This uh, snow lines will be changing over time. So this is actually difficult to, so this is a, a more difficult uh, property. But what do we expect to find? So what we expect, like uh, going again back to this plot, is that if a brown dwarf or a giant companion is formed through a similar mechanism that a star, then we expect a CTO ratio to be slightly enhanced in relationship to the value for the sun. But if this giant companion is formed at long, uh, uh, higher distance from the host star, then the CTO ratio could actually be enhanced and take values up to one. But if we are looking if we have a migration process after the planet was formed, where the planet accretes a lot amount of solids, then the CTU ratio could be lowered to even subsolar values. So these are the main ideas. And how we are going to try to test this? Well, I have symphony data from uh, on the K-band for 24 objects, 
and these are medium resolution data and they look like this. So I actually already reduced all the data and here you can see we have different uh, resolution and different qualities because they were observed with different integration times with or without AO system, but that's that are another details. So how does my sample distribute? So here you can see uh, the sample uh, compared uh, in age and, and luminosity with different evolutionary models plotted behind for different masses. And the colors represent here the spectral type of, of the sample. And what we are going to do to this sample is, well, to make some modeling and to extract the physical properties uh, of, of the targets. And uh, this can be done uh, by using PROMOSA, which is a forward modeling tool for spectral analysis, which is based on a Bayesian approach. And we're going to use, uh, for now, the BT Settle uh, atmospheric grid, but we are planning to use uh, XRM and ADMO 2021, which uh, will take uh, account uh, for disequilibrium chemistry, which is, as we already saw, very important. But for now, we just started with a simple approach. And here you can see uh, one of the examples, which is ADPP. And it's, it is an interesting case to start the analysis. So I have actually done a uh, fit with BT Settle to all the data, but I will show now ADPP. And here is how the parameters distribute. So uh, we got these different values for temperature, gravity, CTO ratio, and others. And we can see here that the CTO ratio is actually enhanced com in comparison to the solar value. But uh, can we trust these results? This is the first question we may ask ourselves. And the answer is here. So why ABPP is interesting? It's because we don't only have data on the K band, we have archival data on the J and H band as well. And if we make the same model, but using now all the available data, we end up having this temperature. And since the potassium line are good for estimating the gravity of the system, here I made a sum and, and put the gravity value. And since the CO band heads are good for estimating the C2O ratio, then here I put the C2O value for this model. So we're looking at, at the first model, at the, at the model on, on all the bands. But then if we make a different approach and model each band separately, then for the J band, we will derive a very different temperature. And this will then make uh, us uh, have a very different uh, gravity as well for the system. But if we make then the model just on the K band, as I already showed, the CTO ratio is actually very different as well on, on both models. So we have the same model, but just uh, run it on different wavelength range and we derive very different parameters. So this is actually a, a complication of the models. And the idea for now is to test the other atmospheric grid to take into account this equilibrium chemistry and other uh, properties and try to get uh, robust parameters for the, for the physical properties. So just to compare ABPP with uh, the stars and in the range of, of the outcomes of the different models, we can say that ABPP has a CQ ratio of 0 0.63 plus minus 0 0.1, so very roughly. And this then could mean that actually ABPP was formed like at the current uh, location, which is approximately 200 AUs from the host star through a gravitational collapse by a gravitational instability mechanism. Or maybe it was formed inside the water ice line and then it was scattered outside by a planet planet interaction. And this is actually not so crazy because, as uh, we know, or, or we, we estimated that ABPP has a very eccentric orbit, which could be a signature for having this kind of event. And then it could have been for uh, somewhere between these two points and then have migrated and accreted a lot of amount of solids through this migration, which will then lower the CQ ratio again. So all these are possibilities and we can actually not conclude. These are like just ideas for now. And yeah, so final conclusions is that uh, we can trace the origin of formation by looking at this 
chemical properties of the atmospheres, but as precise spectral analysis is very challenging and this is our, the point where we are staying right now. And we have to be sure that the parameters, the physical parameters that we are deriving are not biased before getting any conclusions because then the conclusion would not make sense otherwise. And yeah, this project is actually the start for systematic analysis to fill c 2 ratios and metallicity histograms, which will serve as a reference then for exoplanets since we're looking here at high mass objects. So I will be happy to take any questions. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk. Um, we do have a few minutes available for questions. Uh, and I say again, if anyone has any questions, you can either raise your hand and unmute yourself or write them directly in the chat. Um, yeah, I, I was just I was going to ask about the kind of future of doing this for looking at a systematic analysis, but you kind of already mentioned it there and um, how many kind of targets do we have to look at where we can do this level of analysis of looking at the C2 ratio and saying something about their formation mechanism? Do you already have a sample put together? The sample of this 24 targets that are looked at that are observed on the K band. So K band is interesting because of the CO band heads and that will help to derive the C2 ratio. Mm -hmm. But uh, on a wider uh, wavelength ranges, uh, I'm not sure. But for the master project, the idea is to make this for the 24 objects I already have. And then, uh, yeah, we will see. We will try to uh, compare it with literature values and I don't know. Try to fill this histogram because 24 targets for a histogram is not so much. <laughs> yeah, it's a good starting point though. <laughs> awesome. Does anyone have any um, questions? I appreciate it's getting towards the end of the day, especially in Europe <laughs> on a Friday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much again. And if anyone does think of any questions that they have, then you can move them to the uh, Slack channel and the Friday Slack channel, and you can answer any questions in there as well. OK. All right, well, let's move on to the next uh, and the final talk of this workshop. Um, so next up, we have Kelly Wood, um, Kelly Hood, sorry, um, who is going to be talking about high precision abundances for substellar atmospheres, medium resolution retrieval of a T9 dwarf. Uh, so Kelly, if you are there, you can share your screen. Yep. Um... Okay. Does that look? Reasonable? Yeah, that looks great. Okay. All right, take it away. Okay, thank you. And yeah, thanks to everybody for sticking with me until the very last talk of this conference. Um, so I, my name is Callie Hood. I'm a grad student at UC Santa Cruz. Um, today I'm going to be talking about the uh, project that I've been working on lately, uh, which I've titled here, Brown Dwarf Retrievals on Fire. So fire is a spectrograph. Um, atmospheric retrieval of a T9 dwarf with medium resolution spectroscopy. So I've been working on this project mainly with um, my advisor, Jonathan Portney at UC Santa Cruz, and then also Mike Line at ASU. So Theodora gave a great overview, um, but brown dwarfs provide a great test bed for our understanding of the chemistry and physics in cool substellar atmospheres. So on the left here is a color magnitude diagram that she also showed uh, for a selection of brown dwarfs and giant exoplanets, where we can see they have similar colors and so possibly similar atmospheric processes. Brown dwarfs and exoplanets can span a similar temperature range, meaning the important chemistry and physics that shape their atmospheres could be similar. However, we can generally get much higher quality spectra for brown dwarfs because you know they're not getting like outshone by a host star. So on the right here is a near infrared spectral sequence of cool stars to brown dwarfs, where we can see the effect of decreasing temperature on the chemistry in these objects. So for example, the appearance of the methane band in T dwarfs. So spectra like these can help us determine how well our current models do and our theory does at reproducing conditions for these cool substellar objects. 
So we've learned a ton of information about brown dwarfs by comparison with self-consistent grid models. So those are the ones Theodora talked about that can give you a model spectrum for a small number of parameters like effective temperature, gravity, metallicity. However, these models um, can include many assumptions like radiative and chemical equilibrium that might not be true uh, and do not always provide good matches to brown dwarf spectra. Retrievals or Bayesian inverse models offer an alternative way to learn information from brown dwarf spectra with uh, far fewer assumptions. Retrievals do, though, involve many more parameters, and they can also result in possibly unphysical solutions. So it's really important to think about whether your retrieval results still like mesh well with our current understanding of the physics involved. Uh, Mike Lyons successfully applied retrieval methods to 11 low resolution T dwarf spectra back in 2017. Uh, yielding abundance and temperature pressure constraints, as well as just a better fit to the data than the grid model fits. So you can see an example of that here on the right. So for my project, we were curious about what retrievals could learn from higher resolution spectra of brown dwarfs, although really here I mean more like medium resolution. Um, so thinking ahead to JWST observations, there are 11 planned GTO programs that involve observing substellar objects with new spec at a resolution of 1,000 or 2,700. So before we get to those observations, more work is needed to assess where our current modeling tools fall short and accurately, accurately reproducing high quality and higher resolution spectra, and what that means for our current understanding of these objects. So just some initial thoughts about how things might change. As you increase the resolution of a spectrum, molecules can start to be resolved into distinct lines like we've talked about a lot this week. So it's easier to tell which features are you know, from water versus methane, but then the accuracy of your line list that you use becomes really important as well. In addition, the upper atmosphere is more readily probed by your strong lines. So the upper end of your temperature pressure profile is gonna be better constrained. So to start to answer this question, um, I've been working with a FIRE spectrum. So FIRE is an Achelle spectrograph for the Magellan type telescopes of a nearby T9 dwarf, uh, 0722 is what I will call it as a nickname. This is a very well-studied brown dwarf and is actually one of those objects that we're going to observe with James Webb. So uh, the spectrum here on the left is uh, at a resolution of about 6,000, covers 0.9 to 2.5 microns simultaneously with a pretty high signal to noise. Uh, Bachansky et al. published this spectrum uh, 10 years ago in 2011, and by comparing to line lists, uh, they identified water, potassium, methane, and ammonia features. And they also determined physical parameters for this object, like surface gravity and temperature, by fitting to grid models, although they also saw that the grid models weren't doing a great job at fitting the spectrum. So I'll be using Mike Line's Chimera retrieval framework to analyze this fire spectrum. Here's a schematic overview of how the retrieval algorithm works. Uh, this is adapted from a figure made by Joe Zaleski. So on the left are all of the inputs to the model. So we assume uh, one gas mixing, mixing ratio per um, molecule that we're including. So one like that's constant throughout the atmosphere. And then you also have to include the opacity data for those species. Uh, a temperature pressure profile, which is parameterized by 15 different set uh, knots in the atmosphere and then is subject to a smoothing condition. A cloud model, um, which includes the cloud volume mixing ratio, the pressure of the cloud base and the sedimentation efficiency, uh, the surface gravity of the object, as well as a radius over distance scaling factor. So that's what's used to scale the spectrum to the observed flux. I've had to add two new parameters, the radial velocity and the rotation velocity, because at this resolution, those have a measurable effect. And then finally, instrument parameters like an uncertainty in the wavelength solution. So those are all put into the forward model, which uses those inputs to determine the atmospheric properties at each level. And then a radiative transfer model is used to generate an emission spectrum. That emission spectrum is then convolved with the instrument resolution and scaled, giving you the final bend model spectrum. And this is all done in an MCMC framework. An important note is that we have to use the GPU version of Chimera uh, to make this project feasible, just due to the increased spectral resolution and the broad wavelength coverage, um, generating a spectrum can still take a bit of time without the GPUs. So there is a specs uh, low resolution spectrum of this object at, at a resolution about 100. So as an initial test, I took our uh, higher resolution fire spectrum, 
smoothed it down to 100. And just to make sure our retrieval on the smooth spectrum gave us similar results to the retrieval on the spec spectrum for the same object. So on the left here are the retrieved uh, temperature and pressure profiles. And then on the right is just sort of a selection of the parameters we're including. So uh, surface gravity in the upper left and then various molecular abundances. So the answer was yes, uh, things agree relatively well, which was reassuring. And we'll come back and compare our fire results to these specs results later just to see uh, what difference the spectral resolution makes. But probably the most impactful of the various changes I've made in the course of working on this project was updating the line lists for methane and ammonia that we were using. So here's a plot of a snippet of the fire spectrum where we expect ammonia to dominate in gray. So the data points are in gray. And then a model using the older Yurchenko 2011 uh, ammonia list in blue. And then the updated uh, Coyute XML list from 2019 in orange. So the updated list definitely fits the data a bit better in some parts of the spectrum, like you can see here, um, but it's not like super dramatic and some of the lines were still not fitting like perfectly. But we do actually see that the different line lists lead to slightly different retrieved abundances. Uh, so when we use the maybe more accurate, more up-to-date ammonia we, uh, line list, we detect more ammonia. Um, however, the much more dramatic effect is when we change the methane line list that we use. So again, here's a plot of uh, a different snippet of the fire spectrum. Those are the gray data points. And this is where we expect methane to dominate. And we have a model using the older 10 to 10 methane list um, from your tanko 2014 in blue, and then the updated high temp line list from Hargreaves et al 2020 in orange. And you can see that the new high temp methane is just clearly a much better fit to the methane lines in the data. Um, before, when we were using the older methane, we weren't really like fitting anything in this region of the spectrum well at all, and we were having trouble getting a model that fit the data. So this new high temp methane list uh, combines the high trend 2016 data with the ab initio line list of Ray et al 2017. So the Ray paper um, included empirical corrections to mil millions of the strongest transitions to improve the accuracy of the line positions. And we can really see the difference that that made. So perhaps unsurprisingly, using those two different line lists lead to very different retrieved abundances. And since the methane abundance changes that can then affect all the other parameters as well. So it's a bit scary maybe that the choice of line list can have such a big effect. Um, and that's definitely something that we need to think about when it comes to James Webb observations, but definitely a lesson from this and I think has also come up this week is just that it's important to be as explicit about which line list you're using as possible anytime you're reporting results. So here I'm comparing our preliminary fire results uh, to the constraints from specs. So the fire results are in blue and then the specs constraints were in gray. And we can see that overall, we see a much higher precision on all of our retrieved parameters. So for the retrieved temperature pressure profiles on the left, uh, we can see we have very tight constraints from about 0.5 bars to 15 bars, um, which is consistent with uh, what region of the atmosphere we expect these observations to probe. Looking at the selected parameters on the right, the surface gravity in the upper left uh, and the various molecular abundances, they're all consistent within like two sigma of the specs results, but there's definitely a bit of a shift. And we also see now at this resolution, we are constraining the CO and H2S abundances much uh, more than we were before. And in particular, the CO abundance uh, is much higher than expected for chemical equilibrium. So that definitely indicates the probable importance of vertical mixing in the atmosphere of this object. So again, the greater precision on all the species, but particularly for CO and H2S is due in part uh, that at higher spectral resolution, the molecules are just easily disentangled. And also with such a high signal to my spectrum, we're sensitive to really small effects on the spectrum. So here I'm plotting representative cross sections for our major molecular absorbers across the wavelength coverage of fire. So the H2S constraints are entirely from a very small portion of H band. And then the CO constraint is actually coming from partly H band and then also a little bit of K band as well. Uh, and that's when the other major absorbers, especially in H band reach a minimum. And that's where we can see the H2S. Uh, but these small effects on the spectrum are only really detectable with high signal to noise medium resolution spectra. 
So since our retrieved CO abundance in particular is incompatible with chemical equilibrium, we compared our retrieved abundances to the ATMO grid models that have been mentioned a couple of times um, from the Phillips paper last year. And they had two different non-equilibrium sets uh, with either strong or weak vertical mixing. So here I'm plotting our retrieved volume mixing ratios of various molecules. Those are the solid lines uh, with the shaded regions on either side being like the error bars from our retrieval. Um, Overplotted in the dashed lines are the volume mixing ratios predicted from the ATMO weak mixing model and for a surface gravity of about four in CGS units, um, the closest to our retrieved value of 4.1. And this is also for an effective temperature of 550 Kelvin. The publicly available ATMO models don't have ammonia abundances for these models, so I can't plot an ammonia comparison line. But otherwise, we see our results are you know, at least in a similar ballpark of sorts to this model, although our retrieved CO abundance in particular, uh, the orange curves, is a bit smaller than is predicted by this ATMO model. However, our specs retrieval and other um, studies of this object in the literature prefer a slightly higher surface gravity, so closer to a log G of 4.5. So we also compared our abundances to the strong and weak mixing cases uh, shown here for the ATMO models at that higher gravity. And uh, the strong is in uh, dotted lines and then the weak is dashed lines. And we can see that either one actually gives us a, a CO value that agrees within our error bars. Um, although it's harder to see in this plot, but the methane and water abundances actually definitely prefer the strong mixing case. The weak mixing lines are just like slightly outside of our uncertainties. Um, but overall, it's just somewhat reassuring that a free retrieval like we were doing that had very minimal assumptions about what these abundances should be are giving us physically plausible results and results that are somewhat consistent with um, our predictions for what these objects might look like. However, there is another hiccup uh, when we compare our retrieved temperature pressure profile to the uh, ATMO models. So here, again, the strong and weak mixing models for that higher gravity case are the dotted and dashed lines, but they're kind of on top of each other, so you can't really tell the difference. But we find that the closest temperature pressure profile to what we're retrieving is actually the chemical equilibrium model for the lower gravity case. So we're still trying to figure out um, where exactly some of these discrepancies are coming from. Uh, there's a potential for, there's some regions of our stitched final spectrum that maybe are having issues with the order stitching um, when their data reduction was done. So I'm currently running a retrieval where we're sort of leaving out those parts of the spectrum and we'll see how that changes things. So these are definitely still preliminary results, but I wanted to give y'all an update about what we're working on and um, what we think we'll see in the future. So just some a summary and some next steps. So in prep for high signal to noise and medium resolution spectra with James Webb, we really need to assess how our current modeling tools and theory will compare to these better quality observations. So to that end, I'm working on applying the Chimera retrieval framework to medium resolution spectroscopy of brown dwarfs. So I'm starting with this one test object, uh, but there are about 11 or 12 late T dwarfs observed with the same instrument. So we would ideally like to move to a sort of population level study. And then we can look at things like the C to O ratio that we just heard about in the last talk. The increased spectral resolution of fire compared to specs gives us much more precise constraints on the temperature pressure profile and chemical abundances, particularly of um, molecules that have maybe more subtle effects on this spectrum like CO and H2S. Choice of line lists, though, we do see matters quite a bit for these kinds of observations and can have the potential to lead to very different retrieved abundances. And then finally, our current retrieved abundances are reasonable compared to ATMO non-equilibrium chemistry models. But there's still some lingering questions around, around the surface gravity and the temperature pressure profile. So with that, I will leave up the slide and happy to take any questions. Great, thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk. Um, it's so exciting to see these much higher resolutions, these medium uh, resolutions come about for uh, brown dwarf spectra and um, no, no longer just talking about R of 30 or so, which is good. <laughs> um, if anyone has any questions, we do have a few minutes. I do appreciate that it is uh, Friday afternoon in Europe, so <laughs> getting closer towards the weekend. Uh, but if anyone does have any questions, you can raise your hand. 
um, we'll write them in the chat. I am personally very excited for the uh, upcoming NeoSpec JWST observations of these kind of substellar objects. So I'm also a little bit biased because I work at Space Telescope, but I am very <laughs> excited. <laughs> yes, I, I'm very excited to be inevitably surprised and baffled by whatever observations we get. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, I don't see any hands or anything. I do appreciate that it is the very end of the workshop. So thank you <laughs> everyone for hanging on and, uh, oh, wait, we do have one uh, question uh, from Lucas who says, hi, great talk, thank you. I was wondering what kind of parameterization you are using for your temperature uh, pressure profile retrievals. Yeah, so, um... If you want to take a look at either of Mike Lyons' brown dwarf retrieval papers, so 2015 or 2017, he goes into more detail. But the basic idea is we have uh, 15 different like knots in the atmosphere. So and those are all those can all vary within our retrieval. Um, and over a, a range of uh, log pressures. So we just sort of retrieve what temperatures should be at each of those 15 points. And then to actually generate the spectrum, we then like interpolate between them onto a higher or a finer grid, I guess. And there is a smoothing condition that's uh, added. So basically like a prior on how, cause you don't, if you just let it be whatever, then you might get like a really jagged temperature pressure profile that changes a lot. So we do have sort of a penalty on um, sharp changes in like the second derivative. Great. Great. I do not see any other questions come up, but if anyone does think of anything, then there is the Slack channel uh, where you can continue the discussion. Um, I will now hand over to Ilya, I believe, uh, for some closing remarks to the workshop. So thank you. Thank you, Emily, and thank you to the speakers of that session and obviously the whole day. So just before we we close the workshop, just, just some quick remarks. Uh, so first of all, I wanted to, I don't know if she's connected, I don't think she is. So as you know, this workshop obviously was organized and supported through uh, through ESO. So we've had, uh, so the, uh, the SOC, we've had great help and support from ESO and especially from from Estella uh, Shatsiotis Klinger, if I uh, if I say her name right, I hope she's connected. So a big thank you to her, big thank you today uh, to all the lecturers uh, for the first two days, and of course all the members of the SOC that they spent a lot of time and effort organizing this thing. Uh, big thank you to all of you for uh, for joining, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, those that enjoyed the. In, uh, those that joined just the conference and those that joined also the full full week, I, I hope you all enjoyed what what we had. Uh, please take uh, take a few minutes to fill in the questionnaire that would help us uh, improve uh, any any future um, versions of this this workshop that that we are hoping that we will be able to to continue. Um, and I hope that this uh, workshop has inspired you a little bit to maybe uh, apply for ESO, ESO, um, ESO time, right? Because obviously you've heard a lot of talks uh, showing results uh, using ESO, uh, in instruments at ESO facilities, be it, be it at Cerro Paranal or, or uh, La Silla, both in Chile. As, as you've seen, ESO provides a whole wide range of instrumentation for detecting exoplanetary atmospheres being in low resolution or high resolution. Uh, those are some of you might have already seen that the call for proposal was already open yesterday and the deadline is 12 CET on the 23rd of September. So you have less than a month to, to get those proposals in. So hopefully you've been inspired to maybe write some more proposals and obviously collaborations. Please feel free to hold on to obviously the list of participants and, and write to any of us that you think that you can, if you have any nice ideas and maybe you need some, some help with the specific details of ESO instrumentation. Um, if for those of you that need maybe a certificate of participation, please send an email to ATMO 2021 
and uh, we will be sure to, to send you one. The recordings of the three days of the conference will soon be up on YouTube. I just have to do a bit of editing to make sure that obviously the individual files are not too, too long. So I think I will do kind of session by session and I will put them on my YouTube channel for the time being. And uh, just one last nagging request again from the speakers, just remember to send us your PDFs at some point so we can, we can put them on the, uh, on the website. And before we close up, I just would like to maybe open the, open the floor for if, if anybody would like to make any comments about the workshop or the, uh, or the lectures, any, any criticism that you might have, any suggestions for improvements, or any general comments. Um, we have maybe a few minutes before, before we, uh, we close the Zoom. Everybody's already ready for the for the weekend. No, no, no comments, no suggestions. Okay, then I guess with that we can we can close the conference. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, best of luck in your future research. Uh, please stay in touch. Let us know uh, whatever ideas you might have. And we hope to continue this at, at least not on a yearly basis, but hopefully maybe on a bi on a bi well biannual uh, basis. So if any of you are interested, maybe joining the SOC and uh, any ideas for organization of this workshop, uh, please do get in touch, and uh, we'll be happy to 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 have you. We have a question, Eliar. A question from. From Nicolas. Nicolas, please, Nicolas, go ahead. Uh, I have a slight critique. Um, can you maybe not a biannual, but if it, an annual uh, one of these would be great because um, this was perfect for me. I found that a lot from this. So um, I think there's a big demand for it. So if you can, it'd be great, it'd be good. But yeah, just to let you know. Yeah, I mean, please let us know. So those, especially obviously students with master PhD or young postdocs, let us know if, if this is something that you really would like on an on yearly basis. I mean, it's it's a lot of work, uh, as you can imagine. <laughs> yeah, <of course. laughs> yeah. But no, I mean, that's, that's great for me to hear, obviously, that if you if you like it on a, on a yearly basis, we can, I mean, we can try and obviously, if, if we have a big group that are willing to do this, so we don't have the same SOC every time. So not everybody has, has to do this every year. Would be great and i mean i would really like to if, obviously if 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 covid allows to uh, for for the nerve for, for the future editions to actually have this uh uh in person yeah and and one one thing that obviously we would definitely like to improve is the basically the length of the lectures and hopefully maybe make them a bit longer so that the students have more time to digest the material. So we've received your feedback and we will definitely go through them in detail and we'll make sure we improve it. So yeah, we'll take that, we'll take that in mind. And yeah, if, if there is enough demand for it, we will, we will do it on an annual basis, of course. Cool. Well, thank you all for your work. It's, all, it's really appreciated. Thank you for attendance. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there is...